Hello folks, tonight I am going after the Rosette Nebula. Now I've captured this a couple of times before, but I'm still not 100% satisfied with it, so I thought I'd give it another shot. And right now I'm probably going to focus on doing the Hubble palette. I know I'm dwelling on narrowband these days. I want to get back to broadband, but now for me is not the right time with the moon at 80%, but I definitely want to start doing that again because there's some galaxies back I'd like to capture. But for now, um, I am doing HA tonight, and it's <laughs> I finally got a clear night, too. Imagine that. Uh, it's not that clear. I mean, my mean readout is, is rather high. It's at uh, 1,013. I'd like to see that down near the six or 700 range, but I'm sure... There might be a little bit of haze up there, and probably uh, the moon at 80% might be affecting that too. But uh, yeah, four minute exposures, and with at unity gain 139 and offset 21. And this is, oops, well, while we're here, I don't know why that just switched over, but there's my PhD too. That's what my guiding looks like, uh, 0.90. Uh, that's not great. I'd like to see it a lot lower. Um, I'm pointing eh, somewhat in the high south area. It, 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 there might be some crap up there causing me to not guide so well. Let's take a look at my stars. As long as my stars are around, I think I'll, I can live with it. Yeah, those stars look pretty good. Let's go side to side here. Yeah, over on the left looks pretty good. Let's see the right. Yeah, that looks pretty good too. Let's go up. Yeah, there might be some field curvature going on, but that's not much. I'm okay with it. And um, uh, one thing I wanted to show you is I'm paying a lot more attention to the image history now. And uh, this is really useful. Um, you, you know, especially if you've woken up in the morning and you want to see um, how the how the numbers look. And if you look at here, you know, and the thing is, from this is going to be different data when you switch to different objects, but for me, since I work on uh, the same object for multiple days, I can get familiar with how the numbers should look. And you can see up here, my star count was 418 or 400 on sub 49, 418 on sub 50, and then it dropped. Um, and if I woke up in the morning, I might be wondering, well, what happened there? Well, but I can see already, I can look outside where my scope was pointing, and I, when I was going through my power line, which is right above my scope at this time, and that's what caught, you know, that probably takes up quite a, a bit of view at my field of view, so that's why the star count dropped off, but as I got past my power line, it rose back up a little. But even, I thought even more important than star count is the HFR, because, uh, when I'm on an object like, for example, the Helix Nebula, where I only have a two and a half hour window, I pay attention to this HFR because um, this really tells you how pinpoint your stars are. And if I don't see this value increasing steadily, that means I'm probably holding my focus pretty well. And if I'm holding my focus well, what I will do is Here's my focus right down here, that little star. See how it's, it's, it's highlighted right now? If I click on it, now it's grayed out. Now, with it grayed out, I've just turned off my autofocus. And when I only have two and a half hours, by turning off autofocus, I'm going to save a few more minutes per hour. I, I, I do an autofocus every 45 minutes. So this really comes in handy when you're awake and if you happen to be in front of your desktop. You know, it's, it's just not mandatory to have to do an autofocus when you know your your focus is not changing. The numbers look good. Save yourself a few minutes and, and capture more data. That's what I do. You know, you don't have to. But of course, if you um, leave your your computer, you, you go off to do something else or you go to bed, you absolutely turn it back on because you never know what's going to happen. I would never leave it off while I'm sleeping because you don't want to lose two hours of data or three hours because you just lost focus. So um, anyway, uh, that's just one tip. Oh, and my mean readout just dropped a little bit, so I'm glad to see that. And and look at this. Um, uh, my star count just went back up 
from 382 to 414, and my HFR even dropped a little bit. So that tells me uh, maybe the haze a little lifted a little bit because these numbers definitely look better than the previous numbers. So, okay, well that's all I've got for now, folks. I will see you later. Okay, so I got tired of waiting to finish this nebula. So I actually um, decided to process it for now without the sulfur. So I'm going for an HOO image and I captured um, six hours of HA, that's after the histogram, and five hours of oxygen. And you can see the troubles I'm having with oxygen. And um, it was really bright. And what's interesting is that um, Another person had the same issue with oxygen on a different object in a very light polluted area with astronomic filters. I, maybe it's just the, the astronomic 6NM that's doing this because when he switched to an astrodon um, oxygen filter, he didn't have that issue. So, and I think the oxygen, the astrodon oxygen filter was 3NM. That's a little you know, it's a little tougher when it blocks out a little more light pollution. So I still haven't tried new flats. I want to try a higher mean readout range um, to see if my flats will correct that brightness around the oxygen. If not, you know, in the future, maybe that Astrodon filter is the way to go. Except the only thing that bugs me is that it's over 500 bucks. I'm like, are you kidding me for real? I was kind of angry when I heard that. And that's too much. So I worked a little bit with the uh, um, the background extraction on this to see if I could, you know, get it to this point at least. And eventually I'm going to still um, capture sulfur when we finally get some clear skies. I would like to see this in the, the Hubble palette. And let me show you now what the, um, the different versions I have look like. So this is my combine after I put HA in red and oxygen in green and blue. And I didn't um, break the, per the percentages in any of the, the channels. It was 100% in each channel. And this is, you know me, I, I tend to go through 20, 30 variations that I'll call final. But this time, uh, I mean, the variations were so close, I'm not going to show you them all. But this is the first one I was satisfied with. And I had labeled this one finished, but, you know, after I start looking at it, um, eh, maybe I can alter this color a little bit, just a little bit. And I came up with that. I kind of like it, but of course, that's just me. Um... Some people might like that. I like this. You know, it's it's narrow band, so it you know it can take a few liberties. But a lot of people say, well, you know, H O O. I mean, how do you really define true color anyway? And you know, I know Jason was getting into this a little bit. He was about to go deep, and I'm like, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Jason, he he's the guru, and he was actually talking about getting this. Uh, Ah, what was it called? Um, there's a, a filter you can get. It's an H, like an, it acts like an HOO filter for one-shot color cameras. And I have a one-shot color camera. And I was telling him, well, I don't know if I want to get that for my one-shot color camera. Well, maybe I'll just stick with true color. He's like, well, how do you really define true color? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll save that argument for another day. Um, and so that's one version. And then I think this was the final version right here. I just brightened up the inside a little bit. So I think I'm going to go with this for now. And eventually, when we get some clear skies, I do want to capture sulfur because I do like how this nebula looks in the Hubble palette. And you can tell, you can see um, the original combined. And then my final version here, you know, I tend to, you know, make it pop. I, I, I make it very contrasty. That's just the way I do things. And uh, let me show you some of the previous versions I've done. And this was actually an HOO version of it. I rotated it differently. This is from uh, my the same telescope without the reducer. So I'm really 
close in on it. So, and this one was actually a top pick in Astrobin, which really surprised me. I'm like, really? Huh. Okay, I'll take it. And this is the Hubble palette again without the reducer. I'm really close in on this one too. So, um, I kind of like that one too. And, uh, but I don't know, have, have I made any progress between this and this? That, I mean, this is my, my third attempt at capturing this nebula. And it's just, I keep coming back to it because I'm just not satisfied with the previous work I've done on it. And I don't know if I'm going to be satisfied yet either. I'll wait until I see how the Hubble version goes. And maybe finally I can say, that's it. I'm done. No more. And, uh. Let's go. And this is one more version on my wide field scope. This is another Hubble palette version. And I thought this was really cool. It only has about half the data, about two hours in each filter, I think, between all three narrowband filters. So I, I could probably do a better job now. I've learned a few things since I processed this one a while back. So anyway. Uh, and, oh, let me show you one more thing. There was a squirrel on my front lawn, and I was in the living room, and I, I grabbed my Nikon P900 and got real up close on him. I'm, I'm inside our house and just taking a picture through the, the picture window, even though it's a little bit smudged. But I love that P900 camera. Uh, you can get really close in on stuff, and I, I thought that was a cool picture. So anyway, that's all I've got to share. Thanks for tuning in and uh, clear skies. I hope I get some soon and I hope you do too. See you later.